Um, my name is Rob Patterson, and I teach at a number of different places. I teach at Toyo University's Center for Global Education and Exchange. I'm a lecturer there, and I also teach part-time at an international baccalaureate school, Tokyo Gakage University International Secondary School. So I'm used to teaching all ranges of students from junior high school right the way through to graduate school. And I'm presenting today with one of my I don't know if I should say ex-students because you're not my student anymore. <laughs> You've now graduated into the big leagues. Uh, one of my ex-students, Michael Kubo, who was originally my student at Tokyo Gakuge, the International Baccalaureate School. So what we're going to cover today is how we remotely replaced a real on-campus face-to-face foundation course that she would have been taking if COVID-19 hadn't have came along. So. We're going to break it down into a number of sections today. First, I'm going to give a background to the kind of how we started this course, how it covered the things that we covered, what kind of things we covered and why. And then we're going to transition over to Mayuko and she'll give a background on the academic takeaways that she got from the course, what outputs, presentations, papers, etc. she did from this course we put together and what she thought of the overall mentorship because we tried to cover a whole range of different things. And at the end, we're hopefully going to have about maybe six or seven minutes left at the end for questions, kind of discussion time, that kind of thing. So let's get started. As I mentioned, I teach at this school part time. And back in 2016, Mayuko was one of my junior high school students at this school. The school's an interesting one. It's partly an IB, International Baccalaureate School, and it also has Mombu Kagaksho accreditation as well. So it's a dual track school. And again, Mayuko will give you more details on that when she gets to her session. And she was my student for three, four years, going through a number of different classes. And then just before COVID-19 hit, she got accepted to an undergraduate degree at the University of Sydney. And although she had a direct entry there, she also wanted to go to Australia a bit early to do a foundation course, get acclimatized to the culture, the sort of slightly different academic standards that take place at university from an IB high school. But obviously COVID-19 put paid to that, travel to Australia was suspended, et cetera. So she reached out to me to see if I knew any online courses and teachers who were teaching this kind of thing. In, as a replacement for the foundation course. And she was looking for a teacher who was really, really good, really, really high quality, really experienced in all of these things, really handsome, charismatic and charming. And she couldn't find a teacher like that. So she decided to aim even higher and asked me. So that's how we kind of got it together to start this program. So this then brought a big question to me, what kind of things would I actually cover in a prep course preparing someone to go to university. So what I did is I started looking at my own experience and if I could go back in time, what would I teach my younger self? So on the subject of my younger self, that's me a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I started elementary school in Scotland at age four. I was a bright kid, smart for my age. And it meant that I had actually graduated from high school at the age of 16 rather than the age of 18. And coming from a, a poor family at the time, university wasn't an option for me, so I went into full-time work. Now, you're seeing and hearing all these stories of me, you know, being smart for my age, a high-achieving kid, etc. And most of you are probably wondering, Rab, what went wrong with you in later life? Well, I discovered these things. And... I started work making warships for the Royal Navy. They kind of formed me into what you see now. Now, when I was at high school, you could do the engineering track or you could do a kind of history, geography, social sciences type track. You couldn't really mix the two. And coming from an engineering city, engineering was the obvious one for me. So I worked in there for a number of years. This was one of the ships we made, HMS Cornwall. It was the first of its class. Um, I actually worked on this ship making it. But then after a number of years doing that, the Cold War ended and so did my career. And eventually I transitioned to university doing history. 
And I'm probably the only person I know who has a history undergraduate degree, and I don't even have a history high school certificate. So my first year at university was terrible. I didn't know any of the skill sets that were necessary to do a kind of art, social sciences type degree, because I'd never done this at school before. Everything I had done was engineering. So I then got to thinking, you know, well, if I could have gone back in time and taught myself, what would I teach me in terms of these academic skill sets? And that's what I started to put into the package of courses for Mayuko. So to start with, obviously would have been reading. Now I'd always been a reader as a kid, but usually just reading novels. Here I wanted to teach her the things that it took me time to learn. And now analyzing the book, looking at the background and the biases of the writer, doing detailed textual analysis, and helpful in teaching these kind of skills was this book. And I had a few copies of it lying around. So I sent one to Michael. So we both had the same book. And we used this book when looking at structure of writing assignments, analyzing texts, etc. Uh, one of the other things that we set were some academic objectives. What skill sets did I want her to be able to have and be able to use when this course was finished? So she had already used Google Docs with me in the school class, so collaborative learning was something she already knew about. So we continued to use that and we utilized Google Classroom, shared documents, slides, etc. Uh, we covered the Cornell note-taking system as a kind of efficient way of taking notes for any lectures. Um, I gave her a couple of videos of things to watch, to write reports on it, to practice this. Referencing obviously had to be covered to a higher standard than we had done at school, looking at in-text referencing, bibliographic styles, etc. And hugely important for this was Zotero, so I made sure that her Zotero skills were higher than what I had already covered at school. We also looked at presenting body language, eye contact, slide design, you know, all the different aspects of presenting. And later on today, when she takes over the presentation, you can see how well she's internalized all these lessons. And time management, because this was one of the issues that I found really hard when I was an undergraduate, especially with the distraction of beer. So time management is a really, really important thing for students to learn. And hopefully she's not discovered beer yet, which her time management might still be really, really good. So on the subject of time management, that's probably time enough for me to be quiet, move out of the way and introduce the real star of the show. So I'm going to move out of the way. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Michael, do you want to share your screen and take over? Yes. Uh -huh. Can you all see the screen? Uh, one sec. Yep. Okay. Okay. Hi, my name is Mayuko Kubo, and I'm a first year student at the University of Sydney and currently majoring in anthropology and marketing. And so before I get in and start talking about how RAV's class has helped me in my university classes, I want to first briefly explain about my first semester at the University of Sydney. And so here are the classes that I took this semester. I took Introduction to Anthropology, Introduction to Sociology, Marketing Principles, Studying Arts and Social Sciences. So taking four classes is basically taking full credit in Australian universities. So next, moving on, this is my weekly schedule. And in RAP's class, we learned about the to-do list and using Google Calendar. And if you put to-do list from Gmail, it'll autom automatically transition to the Google Calendar. And you can see your, uh, for example, I color-coded my um, assignments, lecture and tutorial, so that it's easy to see. And um, as you can see, I have two hour, normally I have two hour lecture time and a one hour tutorial time, which uh, where you talk about the lecture content and discuss in groups. Um, and I have that um, two, two hour lecture time, one hour tutorial time for each class. And the red ones you can see on this calendar is the assignments. And before getting into university, I already knew that Australian universities would have a lot of home assignments. And so that is why I got, I felt that I was unprepared and I wanted to become more confident before getting in and I reached out to Rao. And also because I didn't take IB course in high school as Rab mentioned, um, due to my absence from my exchange year at, in Mexico. And also I took a gap year. So getting back to academic reading and writing, I felt that I was still unprepared. And Rab has kindly offered me a course and uh, we designed it together. 
So now moving on to four main things that Rab has taught me that has been helpful to university, uh, my university classes. First is academic writing. So in his course, I learned, he has given me a lot of academic writing tips, as well as different, introduced me to different academic writing tools. And I think this academic writing tool is essential, especially for students who are learning online, because you might not have peers who can do your, a proofreading for your essay. And so being able to enhance the quality of your essay on your own, I think that is something that has been very helpful. And so here are the top three writing tools that I love using. The first one is Zotero. Uh, Zotero is a free referencing application as well as it has a note taking functionality. So I'll talk about this in detail in the next slide. And the second one is Paper Reader. Paper Reader analyze, analyzes your essay and it gives you the evaluation of the word choice, the st writing style and the level of your vocabulary. And the third one is Analyze My Writing. And so this application analyzes your writing and tells you how many common words and phrases you had so that you can improve your essay and not make it too repetitive. So out of these three, I think I use Zotero the most and I find it most useful. And here's what Zotero looks like. And the reason why I find Zotero useful is because Zotero collects information accurately and it generates the, uh, the references for you automatically. And this has been very helpful in my university classes, especially because in one of my classes, a professor told me to do referencing manually. And I thought that would take so much time and I had other assignments to do. So by using apps like Zotero, it's, it, um, I was able to finish this quickly and I thought this was very convenient. And also the second reason why I like Zotero is because you can reuse the sources easily. So as you can see in the left bottom of the screen, there's ethnicity, industrialization, these are the keywords. So basically you can put keywords uh, for each source and by putting keywords, for example, I took anthropology class and sociology class this semester. And because of lecture content overlaps, I sometimes wanna use the same source for the assignment. And so by clicking this keyword, it will show the list of sources that are related to the keyword. So I can re reuse the sources um, for the assignment. And also I can put, in the right side of the screen, I can put the summary of the source so that I don't have to reread the source again. So that has been very helpful. And next up, moving on to the second thing that Rav has told me that has been helpful, which is academic reading. So in his class, we read mainly two books. First is Dogs and Demons by Alex Kerr. Um, and this is a critical analysis of the Japanese society. And the second one is Imagine Communities by Benedict Anderson. And so because Rav has taken his, um, in his undergraduate, he's taken anthropology courses, he's chosen these books for me. And before reading this book, I was exposed to academic readings, however, not in a deep analytical way. So by um, reading these books, I think I was able to engage more critically with the, uh, engage with the reading more critically. And with these readings, what we did was that I wrote um, a review for each chapter. And so I wrote this on a platform called Blogger. And for each review, I had a summary and my reaction to the chapter. And not only was I able to understand the content in depth, but I was also able to, as I said, engage with the reading critically. And because I do weekly readings for all my classes, now, I think it has been very, very helpful. Okay, now moving on to the academic output. I worked on the research paper and presentation in his class. So in presentation, I think you would still do it in your first year or second year of the university. But uh, for research paper, it might seem that you don't really, it's not relevant until you progress to third year or fourth year at the university. However, I think the skills you learn while writing a research paper is still relevant in the first few years of your um, undergraduate study. Uh, for example, writing more than 2000 words, combining information and uh, writing coherently, as well as learning how to do surveys. I think those are still relevant and it has still been helpful in, for example, writing essays and so on. And so one of the first research papers that I've done in his class is this one about the nationalism. So back to the Sokoku days, how exclusive nationalism is jeopardizing Japan's growth as a contemporary diverse multicultural nation. 
And so Rap has given me comments and I've um, uh, improved it. And then I was also, I also made this to a presentation and presented at the Performance in Education SIG conference. And other than this conference, I was also able to present at Mahil University with Rab. And I'm also going to present, and next August I'll be presenting with Rab at Summer Institute of International Education. And I'm also going to be learning his skill, learning the skills I've learned in his class. I'm also going to be um, applying for this competition at Jaltpai. And hopefully and next summer, I'll be applying to the Hawaii International Conference on Education uh, with my research paper on undergraduate education in Japan. So by being able to apply my academic skills to these different opportunities, I was able to feel more confident and prepared uh, before getting into university. And also, um, I want to explain how was I able to apply to these different opportunities. I think the reason is uh, mentorship. And Rab was not only a good teacher, but I think he was a very good mentor. And even with the conferences, he helped me with how uh, he taught me how to apply to these conferences, as well as how to upgrade my academic profile. And regarding the university life, because I didn't have any friends or seniors I knew before getting into the university, I didn't know how what to expect from the university. And I also didn't know how to prepare for the classes. So in this, Rob has um, shared his own undergraduate experience with me. And he's also given me tips on um, time management, how to build LinkedIn profile, how to communicate with professors effectively, and all these things um, that has been so far very helpful. And also I was never, never able to hear these tips from a professor's perspective. That has been very valuable. That has been valuable. So in conclusion, I want to say that personal learning network and resources are very important for students, especially for those who are just starting their undergraduate study. They might not know how to excel in their undergraduate study from the first year. However, having this personal learning network and support system, as well as resources available to them to develop their academic skills, it would make so much difference. Here are the photo credits. So that is the informative part of the session. Now we want to move on to the interactive part of the session. So does anyone have questions? Um, now might be a good time maybe to stop the screen share, you know, so then we can actually see people's faces if we're doing a more interactive part. Okay. So the floor is open. Questions, comments, Edo? Yeah, uh, excellent presentation. I really enjoy your uh, perspective as a student, Mayako. Very good. So um, I was just typing in the chat, I would, uh, but I'll ask the question. One of the things I take away from your, your presentation is one of the best things we teachers can do is to create uh, the learning networks among the students. Mm -hmm. You think that's true? Um, yes, I think that's true. Um, I think Rab has helped me on that as well, by um, also teaching me how to uh, network with different students, diff using different opportunities at the university, um, and also with professors. Um, but with personal learning network, I think I learned that most from his mentorship, as he's been a very good, um, a big support, and he has helped me so much in um, getting into the university. Mm -hmm. So I would say both students and professors. Okay, thank you. Just as a follow up to that as well, um, her situation is a bit unusual in that although she's a University of Sydney student, she's still doing the classes remotely while she's here in Japan. So mm -hmm. and I think this is going to be a problem for a lot of universities that without that face to face content that students usually make in their freshman year, where they build connections, join clubs, do all those kind of things with all of them remotely being students, I think a lot of that element is lost and we need to be creative in how we can build that thing back up. Now, obviously there's a limit to what I can do there because I'm not actually teaching at the University of Sydney, but yeah. I'd be curious to know what those <clears throat> teachers are, and indeed any other teachers are doing to try to help encourage that kind of connection. With my own university classes, I tend to put them into online groups right away and encourage them to have their own online meetings. But yeah, kind of curious to know how anyone else is addressing that problem. 
Well, yesterday I, uh, I heard other uh, talking about the same problem of getting students socialized and um, a lot of them from the early early days got got the students into uh, breakout rooms or, or small groups talking to each other and tried to encourage them to build those connections there and turn their mic to like turn their their uh, cameras on and actually see each other and interact so I, you're right that's a big uh, big problem we're all struggling with Gary, Steve, have you guys encountered that problem or have you got any solutions to how we can help address that or any other questions? Maki, how about you? Yeah, I, I still like kind of like struggling. Like I try to have like breakout, uh, breakout room and then I try to make the students talk, but sometimes like some of them like just absolutely not to want to participate. And then uh, you know, I feel a little bit uncomfortable, like trying to push them so much because they're now considered, I consider them like, as I want to treat them as an adult, not like 10 years old that are like, okay, like go in and like mingle. But, uh, you know, like they have like adult decision to make. And then some of them get in too comfortable, like having this online classes. And then they're not really lady presentable. <laughs> <laughs> to like turn the camera on so like you know like I can't really force them to um put the camera on like you know like I give them warning like you know to be ready to like put the camera on but um how's like Michael like as a student point of view like you know how how do you feel like you know having the do you want to be pushed or like do you <laughs> <laughs> Um, I personally feel that because participating in my in a discussion at the university classes, I see a lot of students who aren't turning on their camera, their microphone, and they aren't participating. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's a limit to what teachers can and what professors can do as well. Mm -hmm. Because my professor also told me he can't um, tell students to turn on their camera because they're different situations. For example, they can't like show their backgrounds and all these stuff. So I think there's a limit to what teachers can do, but as a student who's turning on the camera, I would also like to see other students turning on their camera yeah. participating. So yes. I, th I think so important. maybe there's a different, a slightly different issue maybe for myself and Maki in this particular, Mayuko, thank you for such a wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. um, essentially to me, you're, you're, you're fluent at English. So that is where, where there's, different teachers have different levels of fluency <laughs> in their class. So um, for example, when I put students into breakout rooms, often they are very shy. They, so they're negotiating something in a second language. So they're not really constant. Mm. They're not able to focus on what the, their goal is. They're just trying to negotiate through saying a few words. There was an interesting thing. I used Discord in one class once and I, Discord, I, you know, you hopefully you've been using the Discord server for this conference, and um, I did both chat, typing chat, and then like a very like Zoom where they went into breakout rooms like Zoom. And at the end of the class, I did a vote: which one did you prefer, typing chat or in just uh, video chat? Um, Seventy-three zero was the vote <laughs> to text. The students liked typing and it was fun for them. They, they, they said, I felt kind of relaxed. I could use emoji and stuff. And yeah. so they could kind of feel that they could express something and they could express their personality somewhat. Um, and that I think is maybe a difference in your case is that if, if there are lower students, not all of these, they're just trying to negotiate language, which can be, if I have to do things in Japanese, my ability at other things falls apart. <laughs> so it looks as though I'm useless at using the computer. Maybe someone would contend that I am useless at using the computer, but I'm like, I know how to do this stuff, but when I'm speaking in Japanese, I simply are not made, unable to do simple things. So maybe that's part of it. <laughs> well, I think another issue as well is with Michael being at an Australian university, there's a, a minimum level of English they need to even get in. And I think it's probably like IELTS 6.5, which is like 
Seth or C1. So I, I don't think that that issue of them not having the language would be a factor there if they've needed to show a certain language to get in, unless, of course, they've lied on their application. <laughs> Yeah. Well, definitely, like Michael's, like you're like a great uh, student. I think like probably the one of the star students. Like you know, it, it it's it doesn't really matter like your language ability or not. Like if you have like a determination to like learn and then like um you know study and then so eagerly like you know I I would totally appreciate like if any of my students have your enthusiasm <laughs> so but uh, yeah like so yeah it's, it's basically it's just um, how the it's not just the language ability but like um, you know just the eagerness to learn and then communicate and and solve problems, I think. That is, of course, we're all coming across new problems that we haven't had before. Mm. And having to find solutions to new problems is part of what is being a student. That's what, so I think this, this, this situation means that think, nobody really knows what they're doing. Is my, I, I feel like we're just beginning to understand. But if we think that the, the pre-COVID education system took, you know, two or three thousand years to get put together and suddenly we have to do this in a few months <laughs> well things are going to go wrong students aren't going to know what to do teachers are not going to know what to do and I think I think um, I think yes as, as Mackie said the determination to do or find solutions to problems I mean for example um, a very simple thing that I've discovered in amongst my Japanese students, sometimes I'll be speaking and my microphone is off. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I once did this for 10 minutes in front of 70 Japanese <laughs> students. Nobody said anything. Um, it happened again a few weeks later with 60 Japanese students and there was one Korean student and the one Korean student after 30 seconds said, oh, Professor Ross, your microphone is off. <laughs> so that's 130 to one. Yeah. In that not one Japanese person had the courage to say your microphone is off. I mean, it's it that that's kind of odd to me. So there's a needs to be a cultural shift, I think, sometimes in just being able to do simple common sense things. I know people are shy, but you know, this is and a number of people have talked about this issue. You know, mm -hmm. that's just an example, of course. I mean, Gary, another explanation for that might be they think they're being nice to you by not publicly exposing your mistake. Yeah, or or, or they just yeah. didn't want to listen to me is well. <laughs> oh, another, that. another possibility. Yeah, that might um, be the case, but <laughs> I actually, uh, I had a similar situation recently where, where I started talking and I went through a whole vocabulary explanation and was getting ready to assign them another task. And then finally, somebody in the text chat wrote Kikoimasen in Japanese. Yeah. I'm like, oh. And then I looked and went, oh, somehow I turned my, my, my uh, mic off. And then I went back and said, what, what didn't you hear? And they said, Nothing. <laughs> so. so, have you well, encountered any tech mishaps like that in your classes online, Michael? Uh, yes. I think one of the big problems we have in my university classes is that there are so many students participating in the Zoom call. For example, we have like 300 to 400 people. And because of that, some students, it's not actually the teacher, but the, some students are turning on their camera and uh, turning on their microphone. And I hear sounds and them talking. So yeah. <laughs> but I think most of the times when the professor is turning off their camera, uh, no, the microphone, hmm. usually someone would point out or yeah, put it in the chat. Multitasking, it's it's something we're learning to do, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so many things happening at the same time and our brain just gets overloaded. As we discovered with the keynote with Miro, nobody knew what to do, right? <laughs> um, if anybody saw that, it was interesting to, to try to learn a new tool. And yeah. I see, I see. But yeah, thanks again. Like, thank you very much for that. Uh, oh. <laughs> that uh, oh. One last thing, I'll let. Oh, okay. Oh, let's go here first. Oh. I'll let my whole finishing is how I started. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just before we go, I just wanted to say that I feel that being prepared and confident before getting to university is very important. 
So if students are struggling or they're feeling unprepared, I would recommend a similar course like this. Yep, so that's it. Um, and thank you for coming and listening. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank, thank you, you very much you. for your presentation. Thank you. That was very interesting. And uh, it's always like good to hear from the student side of view, like as teacher, we could be, uh, you know, just uh, very selfishly one way. <laughs> and then it's, it's always like good to know uh, student point of view. So yeah, thanks again for Rob and Mayuko for a great presentation. Thank you. And good luck uh, with the rest of the conference. Yeah. Cheers.